This lesson further considers the way that bits can be used to represent information. If you look at the screen, what's shown here is the ASCII table, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and it maps numbers such as decimals to other kinds of symbols that we would need in text. For example, letters, numbers, and uh, different kinds of special symbols and punctuation. As an example, the uppercase letter A is the decimal number 65, or that would be hexadecimal 41. So this is a way that whenever we have the bit patterns of zeros and ones, those bit patterns in a binary number representation of, of eight of those could then be used with this table to represent textual information. So as we're typing in an email, and uh, we type, for example, the uppercase A in an email message, somewhere in our computer is the bit pattern representing the decimal number 65. So if we send that, that bit pattern across the internet in an email message, those stream of bits are, are representing that particular ASCII code, and that can then be decoded on the other side and represented as the uppercase letter A. So as an example, if you consider the screenshot here, here are some text from a, he a hex editor. So on the right of the screen is actual text, and then that you see to the left of that is the hexadecimal representation of the ASCII code for the particular numbers that you see on the right. So if you, if you search on the far right, you can see somewhere in that text an uppercase letter A. And if you were then to map that over on the hex, the hex header to the left, you'll find a number 41 somewhere that's in the same spot where the A would be on the right side. And you can see how all the other numbers would map and refer back to the ASCII table on the previous slide to detect that mapping. So if we can look at even the number A in binary, what would be the binary representation of A? So you could ask your students to, on a piece of paper, you know, represent that given the number 65. So you could also ask them if you were to show them this slide, what is, uh, what, what are some of the other numbers that are represented here or letters represented in their hex uh, equivalents? This hex editor also is available for free if you'd like to try that as an exercise with your students. So they could load in a file, a text file, and they could see their own words and the hexadecimal equivalent. It's also important to stress the so what of why we talk about binary numbers. And a really interesting context is how images are represented. So images are represented by individual pixels. So when I introduce this in the class, I use the common idea of, of whenever a student may have been approaching uh, their TV or some other monitor very closely and they see the pixelization and how all those individual millions of pixels together can represent a mosaic that when we step back we can see a real image. So we have um, a discussion on that context and we, we tell the students that each one of those pixels, the millions of pixels that they may see on the screen, is represented by three bytes. And those three bytes each have a red, green, and blue value. So we have a, a single byte for red, green and blue, so a total of three bytes per pixel. So we talk about how many different colors are represented if I can have three different bytes, or 24 bits. So we ask the students to discuss that as an activity, maybe in a group, and see if they can come up with the number of colors that are possible with this scheme. To illustrate how this is used in everyday life, we could also go out to PowerPoint or Microsoft Office or some other application and pick uh, some text and try to change the color. So whenever we try to change the color, for example, in most Microsoft applications, there is a color bar there and there's also a custom color tab. And whenever you click on the custom color tab, as you see here on the left of the screen, you have access to the red, green, and blue values. So students could uh, try one of these applications and play around with the red, green, and blue values to see how that modifies the color. So there's also some interesting applications we can talk about uh, with the students in terms of how things work um, in terms of if they've ever used Photoshop or some photo editing software, how does it really work under the hood uh, in terms of the, the algorithms that might be uh, used, used in those conversions. So if you think about the concept of red eye removal, the idea of having a subset of a photo within a photo so if you look on this photo, there's two separate squares. And if this can be thought of as a two-dimensional matrix, each element inside of that matrix is a single pixel. So the idea then is to go through every row of the matrix, one column at a time. So we're looking at, we're looking at each pixel 
And then as we examine each pixel, we want to check out the red value of that pixel. And if the red value is saturated very highly compared to the other two colors, we like to reduce the red based upon perhaps even some value that the user provided when they invoke this uh, red eye removal function. So computers can of course do this in a very automated way where it would take a long time to do manually as humans, but this is kind of an underlying process or algorithm that we can begin to talk about with students so they can understand what computation is about. So some other things that we can talk to the students about are other media. For example, how is sound represented? So students may be asked to investigate this on their own as a class activity. Maybe they can, can use the internet and search around and try to understand how sound is represented. Concepts such as the frame rate and the sample burn rate, the frequencies of the sampling. So all those things represent issues dealing with audio. And we can also discuss about movies. So um, how much um, information is, can be stored on a DVD, as we discussed in our last lesson, or how much um, information is needed to represent an MP3 file, how many bits are in an MP3 file for a typical song. So another class discussion topic could be uh, asking the students to consider if they had, for example, an 8 megapixel camera, how many megabytes should it actually take to represent that image? So students hopefully will realize that you know, if we have eight megapixels and we've just learned that each pixel has three bytes, well, there should be roughly 24 megabytes. But we ask the students to consider if they've ever looked at the result of a photo that they've taken, usually, unless it's of the raw form, the images are not that large. So roughly four or five megabytes instead of 24 megabytes. So that leads into a nice discussion of how we compress bits and the, the importance and the purpose of compression as an algorithm. So there's often a need to compress information whenever our bandwidth is limited or our storage um, is, has some limitations. So for example, a fax machine has some limitations in terms of the information that can be transmitted over the phone. So being able to represent uh, a, a certain document in a compressed form is very important. So we also would like to ask the students to consider or think about the potential wasted space of duplicating something um, in many different ways. So if I had a, a long stretch of just the color black, it would be kind of a waste to represent each one of those pixels over and over again. So if I could count how many black pixels are in a row, I could somehow devise a compression algorithm that might utilize that information. So the fundamental idea of run length encoding is similar, similar to that. So run length encoding is a compression technique that can be used by hard drives and also by fax machines and in the case of fax machines to reduce the amount of information transferred by a factor of, of seven. So there's also a CS unplugged activity for run length encoding and compression of images that you can find the, the URL on this page. So as an example of compressing information using run length encoding, the CS unplugged activity shows various figures such in this case the lowercase a. So what this means is if you look at the right of the figure, the numbers there, 1, 3, and 1, that represents at the beginning how many white pixels we have, followed by the number of black pixels, followed by the number of white pixels, and so on. So in the very first row of this image, we have 1, 3, 1, which would be one white pixel, followed by three black pixels, followed by one white pixel. If I had on the second row 4 and 1, that would be four white pixels, followed by one black. The interesting case is somewhere around the fourth or fifth row where I actually begin with a black pixel. So the way to indicate that would be to start out with a zero. So I would have zero white pixels, then one black, followed by three white, followed by one black. So the fourth and fifth rows are the same, and then the third and sixth rows are also the same. So I have one white pixel followed by four black pixels. So the information on the right can be used to represent the lowercase a, or if I had a large picture with a lot of similar colors that are next to each other, I could use run length encoding, in particular if it's a black and white image, like on a fax machine, to really compress the images being um, sent over the wire or over the phone in the case of a fax machine. So in this particular slide, there are some other examples, and in the activity associated with this lesson, we'll ask you to try some of these out but don't take a sneak peek at the CS Unplug site yet because some of the solutions are there. 
So this concludes the lesson on representing information with, with bits. And we'll move on in this next lesson to talk about um, other kinds of algorithms and in particular error detection with bits.